Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review on therapeutic drug monitoring. We're going to take a closer look at pharmacokinetics. Okay, so we need to start with the administration of drugs because this is important. So the route of administration will affect the concentration and dosage of the drug. Um, the oral route is obviously by mouth, so this is um, what probably most people are used to, just taking pills uh, or liquids. That, that would work, you know, like liquid Tylenol. Uh, the intravenous route is uh, where the drug is injected into the circulation, so injected into a vein. It has the fastest action, uh, and often this is done in hospitals and clinics and stuff. Then you have the intramuscular route where the drug is injected into a muscle. And then you also have subcutaneous route where it is injected just underneath the skin. There are other routes also like suppository, inhalation, intraperitoneal injections, or topical. Um, and uh, if on some of those, um, using other routes or varying like where the injection of stuff is given can limit the exposure of the same area of body to reduce the side effects. So you can just rotate a patch location or topical application or something like that unless of course your topical application is an antibiotic on a specific sore and then of course you can't rotate you have to put it on, on that um, suppositories can be um, used for uh, drugs that are normally given uh, orally such, such as a let's say Tylenol or something like that where either the patient is throwing up excessively or uh, maybe they're intubated or something where you you can't give them the pills and maybe you don't have the liquid version of it. So anyway, it's just an alternate route of delivery of uh, some drugs. All right, so the first phase of <clears throat> pharmacokinetics is going to be the absorption. So um, if uh, absorption is a factor in orally administered drugs, um, so um, once they're swallowed, these drugs must dissolve in the GI tract. So they have to be not dissolved into the stomach or the intestines and stuff and uh, enter the blood. Usually this is um, where we have absorption going on so that would be in the small intestine and then from there it is transported to the liver via the hepatic portal vein and then the liver metabolizes it and whatever's left is sent to the systemic circulation. So for orally administered drug, the efficiency of absorption from the GI tract depends on many factors. Uh, first, it's the disassociation from its administered form. So, you know, if it's in a, you know, tablet or capsule or whatever, that has to be, you know, dissolved at the right time in the right area of the GI tract and stuff. Um, also, how soluble the drug is in gastrointestinal fluids, you need it to be soluble for it to be absorbed. Um, and then how well it diffuses across the GI membranes. Um, so the drug may have to cross over from the GI membrane into the capillary circulation uh, by uptake, uh, by transport mechanisms that are intended for dietary constituents. Um, or it could be go by passive diffusion. Anything that causes changes in intestinal motility, pH, inflammation, food, and other drugs can all change how well uh, a drug is um, a drug is uh, absorbed. Sorry, um, the variation among population um, as drug absorption rates may change also with age, pregnancy, or pathologic conditions. Um, for example, um, a foods that affect um, some of the uh, it's really, it actually affects more the metabolism, but uh, grapefruit can affect absorption and or metabolism of certain drugs. And you'll see uh, on those, you will definitely see a warning sign, do not take with grapefruit juice. And it's uh, for real, like you've got to avoid that because it can really interfere with the way the drug works. And it's not always it's not always the same way. Some drugs it will cause it to not work, and some drugs it might cause it to have to show toxic effects. The bioavailability is a fraction of the dose that reaches the systemic circulation, um, and it is a factor for orally administered drugs. 
where the bioavailability is going to be less than 100 percent. It's going to depend on the drug's formulation, whether it's an immediate versus sustained release. But again, you, you have the whole factor we just looked at with the absorption that, that it has to be able to dissolve into the GI system. It has to cross over into the capillary circulation. And then it goes to the straight to the liver, which is going to start trying to get rid of it, right? So whatever you ingest in an oral drug is not what's going to, to reach your bloodstream. It's a lot less reaches actual bloodstream. Um, bioavailability issues are, le are less of a factor for IV and inhaled drugs because the bioavailability is usually 100% when it's first, you know, inhaled or uh, administered um, because it can't, it's directly already in the bloodstream. Now, of course, that blood is going to go by the liver and the liver is going to start trying to pull that drug out, but uh, for a little while, for a little bit anyway, the bioavailability is 100%. Then once it is in the bloodstream, you have distribution. So that is the process of moving the drug from the site of absorption to our other areas of the body, ideally the target tissues that the drug is intended to help. Uh, the drug distribution is subject to the diffusion out of the vasculature and into the interstitial and intracellular spaces in those tissues. Okay, so it has to be able to leave that bloodstream to get into the tissue to get to the cells that it's intended to target. Um, the distribution is often um, a factor in calculating the dosage per kilogram of weight of the patient uh, so that, you know, the dosage for uh, an infant is going to be a lot smaller than the dosage for an adult because we have to be, it has to be able to be distributed throughout the body and, but you don't want to overdose or underdose them. The distribution also can depend on receptor availability if a receptor is necessary for uh, the drug to have an effect or to be absorbed or something like that. And uh, the drug distribution largely depends again on the lipid solubility of the drug. If, um, if it is a lipid soluble, then a lot of times it has to be transported in protein, on proteins and stuff like that. And so that is a factor of distribution because you have to have enough proteins, of course, to transport them. So a little bit on free versus bound drugs. So most drugs in circulation are subject to binding with the serum constituents because a lot of them are lipid soluble. Only the free or unbound fraction of a drug can interact with its site of action and cause a biologic response. Um, so the, the free drug is what is available for distribution for, to arrive at the, at the tissue. And the free fraction of the drug is known as the active drug. Um, there is limited testing for the tree free drugs, uh, but that is it is possible sometimes to test a free level of the drug versus a total level of the drug. The bound drugs are bound to proteins, which are transporting them in the circulation. Acidic drugs tend to bind to albumin, and alkaline drugs tend to bind to globulins. Um, Diseases and physiologic changes will affect distribution of the drugs. So again, albumin represents the majority of the protein constituent in its plasma. And of course, changes in its concentration can affect the free versus bound status of many drugs. So that relationship. So for example, if your albumin levels would drop, then all of a sudden you would have less bound and more free, and that could change the effect uh, and maybe even cause toxicity. Uh, on some of the drugs at the same dosage uh, as if you had enough albumin in your plasma. The fraction of the free drug may also be influenced by the concentration of substances that can compete for binding sites, uh, which those could be other drugs or endogenous substances such as urea, bilirubin, or various hormones. So what it's competing with to have its effect at the tissue site that is also um, influenced there. Uh, and then we need to talk a little bit about distribution in brain and spinal cord. So in order for a drug to be able to be distributed in the brain and spinal cord, it has to be able to get around the blood brain barrier and into enter that nervous system. Um, because of that, a lot of the drugs, if it's needed to reach that area, they can be given um, and injected into the um, you know, epidural spaces and stuff like that so that they can reach there versus um, giving them an IV. Uh, a lot of them don't cross that blood brain barrier and never, would never reach um, the, you know, the brain.
a little bit on metabolism and biotransformation. So substances are absorbed from the intestines, uh, except those that are uh, put into the rectum like the suppositories. Um, and of course, then they enter the hepatic portal system. Um, and so any, any blood, this is normal, any blood um, that comes from the GI tract, it's always routed through the liver before it enters the general circulation. This is a protective mechanism in case um, you ingest some, something that could be poisonous and all of that. So at least the, the liver gets a first shot at getting it, getting it removed and protecting you. So um, drugs are going to be subject to significant hepatic uptake and metabolism during that passage through the liver. And this is a process that is known as first pass metabolism. So whenever um, drug developers are formulating their drugs, they, they take this into account if this is an oral drug. They know that they have to deal with first pass metabolism and that if the liver removes all of it at first pass metabolism, then you're not going to have any kind of effect whatsoever. Um, so the liver is a principal organ responsible for drug metabolism. Uh, the variation in a person's genetics related to drug metabolism is known as pharmacogenomics. Um, and this uh, can, pharmacogenomics can be used to predict how individuals will respond to a drug. You could have responders and non-responders. Um, but you can also have, uh, on some of those, you have uh, slow metabolizers versus fast metabolizers versus normal metabolizers. So um, currently, pharmacogenomic testing is limited. Um, the Coumadin testing, pharmacogenomics, is one that is currently available. And then for Coumadin, again, they do, they look at slow, fast versus normal metabolizers to, and then you can use that to adjust uh, dosage of the person's uh, Coumadin, which is an anticoagulant. Biotransformation is the conversion of the potentially harmful chemicals into inactive metabolites. Um, obviously, you got to see the liver sees any of these foreign substances we take in as drugs, even though they're supposed to be therapeutic for us, um, as a toxin that needs to be removed. Um, and so it's going to try to remove the drug. And the liver has a couple of different ways where it can metabolize and it's going to depend on the type of drug. So there is first order kinetics, um, which is a linear type of metabolism. The metabolism of the drug is proportional to the drug concentration and um, the drug elimination then is adaptable. 95% of the drugs are going to be on first order kinetics. So the more drug you have, the faster it is metabolized. And then you have zero order kinetics, which is nonlinear, where the rate of metabolism is completely independent of the drug concentration and ethanol and phenytoin or like that. And so it just, it's a factor of time how uh, it gets metabolized. It is particularly important consideration in the efficacy of a drug um, because it depends on the metabolic generation of a therapeutically active metabolites. So again, it's, it's a different way of saying if if when you take the dose and goes through the first pass and the liver literally metabolizes all of it really quickly, then it just is not going to have a chance to enter the bloodstream and go and have its effect. Um, the biochemical pathway responsible for a large portion of the drug metabolism is the hepatic mixed function oxidase system. And then um, the cytochrome P450 or CYP enzyme family clear most of the drugs. This is, um, these are enzymes that are found uh, in big concentrations in the liver. Uh, and your, they can, these also can vary individually how many of those you have. And these, the cytochrome P450 system will affect drug-drug interactions. It can either slow or boost the metabolism of a second drug, how these enzymes work. Uh, it can also affect food and drug interactions. For example, alcohol can compete with drugs for metabolism and cause, uh, you know, a slower metabolism of the drug and stuff. So some drugs pass through the liver to be converted to active forms. For example, procainamide is one of those. And excretion, some drugs to are totally cleared by the liver. The plasma-free fraction of the parent drug or its metabolites is subject also to glomerular filtration in the kidneys, renal secretion, or both. So uh, some, some drugs might be too big for glomerular filtration and then it may end up undergoing renal secretion. 
Drugs that are eliminated through the hepatic can be eliminated through hepatic metabolism, renal filtration, or a combination of the two. Basically, this means that the way drugs leave your body is either through the liver or through the kidneys. The clearance factors uh, that affect excretion are the free drug concentration, uh, the hepatic function of the patient, and different enzyme inducers and enzyme inhibitors, and this is going to be for those enzymes that metabolize drugs. Um, after metabolism, uh, meta metabolites are excreted by the liver. Um, if they are water, water soluble, they'll be um, entered the bloodstream and then be excreted by the kidneys. If they are lipid soluble, they're going to be entering bowel and then be secreted in the GI system and leave through feces. And if they are volatile, they will be excreted by the lungs. Um, they can also be excreted in breast milk and affect the baby. So it's really important to pay attention to what a mom puts in her, bo her body because the baby might be ingesting it through breast milk. And that's your last slide. Thank you so much.